quite, like I say, it's quite eclectic um, music at, at that time. But then also, you know, during that, that time, kind of the end, of the end of the 70s, that electronic feel started coming in. You know, mm. what was your take on that? Creaky chair, yeah. So the um, electronic thing, yeah. I mean, it's it's that thing is really spans the whole of the decade, really, because. I mean, instead, I chose not. To, I was trained to be uh, a viola player in an orchestra, and at the beginning of the 70s, I turned down a chance to go to the Royal Academy of Music, and I joined a jazz rock band, orientated band. So I learned how to improvise. Uh, but in, in some ways, when the punk thing came along, I actually agreed with that. In fact, we preempted it quite a bit with the ultravox thing, you know, uh, with um, vocal lines like uh, "People like you should be put down." talking about hippies and just generally the lecturing sort of... Because I, I suffered a little bit from that, because I was slightly young for the hippie thing. So after a while, I, I got sick of being lectured to as regards improvisation. So we took that punk theme as w with us, you know. But it slightly hindered us, because it had, as you probably know, it had such a stranglehold on it, on everything. And it actually caused Ultravox to eventually to not really get a proper say. So we're talking 77, 78 now, but we were going against the flow uh, pr because we were just difficult bastards, really, mm. and um, which I quite liked. So we were doing um, keyboard orientated things right in the middle of the punk explosion and, uh, and going on stage and getting booed off but a lot of the time. But that's not necessarily really true because we did have quite a good uh, live following. Was so so we would do keyboard things. And I had, I had a synthesizer as early as uh, 1977. And we used to make up sparse, heavy drum tracks just from the synthesizer, you know, take all the release off and everything. And, and we were quite, just quite knocked out just by the power of all this. Because, I mean, it, it, what was good about Ultravox was we would uh, experiment. And that's what kept us all alive, really. You know, it was, even though we knew uh, that we weren't selling many records. <laughs> sure. Well, tell, us, tell people we're in now, have you all this equipment here, it's, you know, in 1999. Electronic and synthesizers are, are just, you know, day to day. But tell, tell us a little bit about how difficult it was to get those things to work practically. In those days. In those days. Yeah, um, well, the first one I got, <coughs> which was the ARP Odyssey, um, I mean, it was, I just didn't bother learning how to play it. <laughs> what I tended to do it was used to put these white, um, paper things over that would slot onto the notches properly, you know, and it would tell you where to move these switches and all that and these sliders. And, and I mean, that was interesting and it helped me. Um, it seemed more complicated than, it, than what it actually was. I mean, I'd go and do these gigs and think, oh, are all the switches in the right place, you know, and it was like, oh, God. And we used to finish, I can give you an example of them not being in the right place. Uh, we used to finish one track off, we used to do a violin solo, very unoffender violin, very um, um, what's the word? distorted, you know. And then we used to finish it off with a sound where you get it so it comes in right at the top and goes right down through the bottom and people would be just like, <laughs> shit, literally. And, um, I had one switch, just one switch in the wrong position, and instead of it doing like that, it ended up doing what's called a sample and hold thing, and made a sound, because I was using white noise. So it'd go ding, 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 ding. So it did this silly musical thing, you know. I mean, that's how... Uh, they could really make you look an absolute fool as well, you know. So instead of everybody going, wow, they'd just piss themselves laughing. Um, I mean, what, basically what I did, because I'm a, like a violin player, and, and the, the climate really influenced what we did, uh, you were pushed around by the audience quite a bit. You're talking about a time when people g were gobbing on you and generally having a swing at you, know, especially the keyboard player. No, um, no it's, it's true. I mean, it's hard to go back to that time. So what I tended to do was make a violin sound, bring it right down and simplify it. So, I, I mean, I, usually, I had two sounds. I had a sound which was a soft sound, like the middle section of Vienna later. Uh, it's all nice and soft. And Or I used to have one which was just a pierce and cut through, you know. Mm. And, uh, and with vibrato <coughs> on. And, and that, I think that came out of really just wanting to be heard, you know. It was like, um, 
you know, quite often I'd see bands on the keyboard, if they weren't playing like a Vox organ or something, like some of the bands at that time, like the Rugulator, which I thought were really good, um, you just wouldn't hear the keyboard player, so it was a bit of a deliberate intention of me to be heard. Yeah, you know, sure. and, and that eventually came our, became the 80s Ultravox's sort of lead sound, you know. But it came really, I suppose, from being a violin player and a desire to cut through. But uh, uh, <coughs> just to answer your question, you know, those things were precarious in those yeah. days. But, I mean, they are now, really, to a certain extent, you know. How did, how did Brian Eno get involved in the, in the first you know, the Ultravox sound? Um, well, we signed to uh, Ireland, this is back in 1976, and, uh, well, we really rated him. We, we liked uh, Another Green World, and we liked... We were into Roxy Music, with him in it. <laughs> no, we, we were into Roxy Music, and, and that's how he came along, you know. He, he was... Um, I think he was on Island himself.